Andrew Jackson would come to dominate American politics in the 1820s and 1830s, and his domination of American politics in this period is sometimes known as the, the Age of Jackson. It was a period when he served uh, two terms as President of the United States, and it's marked by the advancement of democratic principles throughout the country. Another feature of Jackson's era is the birth and development of the modern two-party political system. This is a political system that remains with us to this day and is a permanent feature of the American political tradition. Uh, in this lesson, we're going to do a number of things. First of all, we're going to talk about how Jackson came to symbolize the advancement of democracy and the growth of democratic ideas in the country in this period. And then, we're, second of all, we're going to look at the, Jackson's role in the creation of the Democratic Republican Party, or simply the Democratic Party, which remains to this day and was the first modern American political party. And it would be this party that would play a critical role in winning Jackson the presidency in 1828 and his re-election in 1832. So first of all, let's talk about this new democratic spirit that we see happening uh, in America. Um, America's view, Americans' view of, of government changed dramatically between, let's say, the 1780s when the Constitution was drafted and by the 1820s and the 1830s. Um, the authors of the United States Constitution in the 1787, the people who drafted the Constitution, were for the most part very highly educated men. Most of them came from upper class backgrounds. And they, they were men who, when they heard the word democracy, only had negative views of democracy. They associated democracy with mob rule. They associated democracy with anarchy. They associated democracy with demagogues who would use their power to, to become tyrants and dominate. Now, in their view, when they looked at history, when they looked at earlier republics, like the ancient republics of Rome and Athens, they, they came to believe that these great republics had fallen because too much power had been given to the masses. Too much power had been given to uneducated, ignorant men who didn't know what they were doing. So when they wrote the Constitution, they put into it certain safeguards to make sure that the popular masses were kept in check. For example, in the Constitution, the president is chosen by electors. Uh, and the electors, remember, are not chosen, it doesn't say how they're chosen, but they're chosen by the state legislatures. Also, in the original Constitution, senators were not elected by the people, they were directly elect, they were elected by state legislatures. In other words, the president and the Senate were, were indirectly rather than directly elected by the American people. Even someone we associate with, the, with our republic, someone like Thomas Jefferson, Mr. All Men Are Created Equal, he even believed that a, a, a successful republic needed an elite, an elite of talented men of ability, integrity, and good character who could lead the masses. So, and the, the only difference between Jefferson and the Federalists would be that Federalists believed that wealth and social position uh, were a factor in this natural aristocracy, whereas Jefferson believed that this natural aristocracy was only made up of the elite based on talent and ability and good character. So when we, we leap ahead into the future, by the time we get to the 1820s, all of a sudden Americans' views and attitudes toward democracy had changed radically. In fact, by the 1820s and 1830s, most Americans didn't feel like they had to show any kind of deference or, you know, to men of wealth or high social standing. They didn't think that people of high wealth or high social status were, were better than they were. And, and uh, another thing was that Americans more and more be were believing that, that the people that they elected to office weren't their, quote unquote, leaders as much as their servants. I mean, it was the job of an elected official, in their view, to exercise the will of the people, to do what the people wanted them to do. In other words, by the 1820s and 1830s, democracy was not a bad word, but was a good word. It was the will of the American people, and the American people were good. Now, Andrew Jackson, in many ways, benefited from this new way of looking at democracy, because he himself portrayed himself as a man of the people, as someone who was the, the, the champion of the people, someone who would do their will. Um, remember, after the election of 1824, he was the one who denounced uh, newly elected President John Quincy Adams 
and John and Henry Clay as being snobs, as being elites, as people who had engaged in this corrupt bargain and that had ignored the clear will of the American people who wanted Jackson to be their president. Now, Jackson's claim to be a man of the people was supported by his life story. When people looked at Jackson, they saw themselves. They saw somebody who was one of them. He was, he was raised in poverty. He grew up in the backwoods of Carolina, between North and South Carolina. He, he was raised by a single mother. His father died before he was even born. Um, he received no formal education whatsoever. He, uh, he learned to be a lawyer by teaching himself with, with mentors. And he went on to be a successful lawyer uh, and cotton planter and a successful general, as we've already seen, and a politician. Um, and, and he was a self-made man in the state of Tennessee. And so he was somebody who was not born into an affluent, wealthy family. And so when Americans looked at him, they saw a man who'd kind of raised himself out of poverty and as someone who could speak for them. Now, Jackson's political career coincided in a, with a period of time where democracy was making tremendous advances across this country in many states across the Union. Uh, for one thing, by the time that Jackson was running and for office, states had decided that uh, presidential electors were to be determined by the popular vote instead of being chosen by the state legislature. So whoever won, or whoever candidate carried a state by the popular vote would get that state's electoral college votes. Also, another development we see is an advance for democracy was that in New England, the old Congregational Church was disestablished. You know, the, the Congregational Church had, dates back to Puritan times, and it, it was still as eight, late as 1830 in New England receiving taxpayer funds. It was a state-supported church, but it tended to be the church of the elite, the church of the wealthy. And by this time, by the 1820s, 1830s, Irish Catholic immigrants were kind of pouring into New England in larger numbers. And, um, and so it made no sense to have a, an established church that only represented or su supported the wealthy. And so by disestablishing the, the congregational church, that was a victory for democracy uh, across New England. Another development we see is that uh, in the states along the Atlantic coast, among the original 13 colonies, property qualifications were eliminated. Uh, at, see, when the country was first founded, you had to own vote or had to own taxable property to vote, but those property qualifications were eliminated and the vote was extended to all adult white, white, white males. By 1842, Rhode Island was one of the last states in the Union that still had a property re requirement. It's, property requirement dated back all the way back to the 1663 charter of the colony. But in 1842, a man by the name of Thomas Dorr demanded that the state constitution be changed to allow all adult males to vote, all adult white males to vote. And he led an armed rebellion against uh, the state. Now, eventually, the rebellion collapsed, and, and Dorr himself was arrested and found guilty of treason. But uh, the very next year, in 1843, due to this popular support for Dorr, the state constitution was altered and the right to vote was extended to all white males. So this, this Dorr rebellion reflects the impact of the, the advance of democracy and in this age of Jackson. Now, why did this rise in democracy occur? You know, historians ask these questions. Why was there more and more support for democracy by the time you get to the 1820s and 1830s. Now, one theory is that what advanced democracy was westward expansion. You see, what, as more and more Americans moved west, see, out west, there was such an abundance of land that all adult males could vote. So in the western states, basically, you didn't have property qualifications, you didn't need them. Most everybody who was a white male owned land anyway. And what happened when people saw that in Indiana and Tennessee, in Kentucky and Ohio, when the people saw that these states were just doing fine, even though they didn't have property qualifications, that made people living in the coast, like in Rhode Island or in Massachusetts, say, hey, if they can do it, we can do it too. We, we don't need these property qualifications. Having everybody, all adult males, able to vote, that seems to work just fine. So one theory is it has to do with Western expansion. Another theory is that uh, what caused this rapid growth of democracy was the rapid growth of the market economy. You see, with the growth of a market economy, you had a growth of a money economy. People were spending cash, money, paper money, coins, uh, uh, 
commercial exchanges were occurring. And what happened in all this with the growth of the economy was that uh, wealthy planters and merchants, uh, as they did in the colonial period, no longer had a monopoly on credit. I mean, it was possible for the common man, the average person, to go out and get credit without having to you know, do pay you know, deference to the wealthy elites, to merchants or to planters. And so basically, as the common man became less uh, dependent on the, uh, on the wealthy elites, that for credit, that made them more freedom to, of thinking and gave them more freedom in their political views. And that, in fact, could have been a factor in the advancement of democracy. Now, another development we see in this day with the advance of democracy was the development of a two-party political system. Um, Jackson's Democratic Party, the party that he created to win elections, was a party that was directly engaged with the voters. Uh, it worked with the voters. It, it was organized at the state and at the local level. And it would go out and get the people involved through mass political rallies, through parades. They would advertise through posters, through banners, through buttons. The idea was to, to get the people to vote, to get the people mobilized, to get the voters on the side of the party. So these parties had unity, they had organization, and they had party discipline. And that allowed these, these parties, the Democratic Party was very successful in going out to different parts of the country, different regions of the country, and creating a coalition, a national organization that had broad support from the entire country. Now, Jackson was so successful with his Dem Democratic Party that his political opponents said, hey, if it works for them, maybe we can do the same thing. And so the, the Whig Party arose as on along the same lines and organized just like the Democratic Party, uh, using the exact same methods and same techniques. And of course, that, that Whig Party is the, the forerunner of the Republican Party of today. So we can see that in the age of Jackson, we can see that uh, we can see that these two national, these, the two-party political system that we have today was was beginning to form. Now, another aspect of this first two-party political system with the Whigs and the Democrats is that both parties got support from the nation as a whole. They drew supporters from both the North and the South, and and these two political parties even though they were di divided against each other, they actually helped to strengthen national unity because both parties had to draw support from both sides of the country, both north and south. And many historians feel that the collapse of the two-party system in the 1850s was a factor in dividing the north and south and a direct factor in the outbreak of the American Civil War. So Jackson's, the age of Jackson helped to keep the country together through the creation of the two-party political system through the 1850s. Now, now Jackson, let's talk about how Jackson created the, 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 the Democratic Republican Party or the Democratic Party. You see, in 1824, his idea was to bring back what he saw was the old Republican Party, the old Democratic Republican Party of Jefferson, because in his view, uh, Adams and uh, Clay, they were the Federalists in new clothes. You know, they were like, they were secret Federalists. So he saw himself as rebuilding the party of Jefferson. Now, when Jackson built this party, he built it with an ally. He had a strong support by a man by the name of Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren was from New York State. And Martin Van Buren actually built the prototype of what would become the National Democratic Party. He built a real, the first real, Democratic par a first real party in New York State. Uh, now, his party was called the Bucktails Party. Party. Why, they were called bucktails because uh, anytime they had a vote the, to show that they had the support of the people in the state legislature, they would wear bucks, you know, deer tails in their hats. Now, he had created this uh, well-disciplined and organized party in New York State because he felt that the best way to protect the interests of the people against the wealthy and the powerful was by creating a well-disciplined mass political party. In his day, you know, the big old elites were the old landowners of the Hudson Valley. He wanted to create a whole new party and create a power structure to, to kind of break the monopoly that these aristocratic families had in the state of New York. 
So what Martin Van Buren did, one reason why he formed an alliance with Andrew Jackson, because he wanted to take the Bucktail Party and he wanted to project it on a national level. So you had Martin Van Buren and Andrew Jackson kind of teaming up together, working together as political allies. Now what Jackson was able to do was to work with different groups uh, across the country to win their support. And all these, all these different groups, in some way or another, were dissatisfied with the leadership of John Quincy Adams as president and his, and his supporter in Congress, Henry Clay. They, these were people who were opposed to the economic agenda, the economic nationalism of these two men. Now, now Jackson disliked the bank in the United States. You know, he, he thought that bankers, you couldn't trust them. He thought they were all a bunch of speculators. And uh, Jackson promised to different groups that the first thing he was going to do was to get rid, he was going to dismantle the second bank of the United States on the grounds that it was unconstitutional and only benefited wealthy businessmen. And there are a lot of southern planters and farmers who agreed with Jackson. So he went out to these southern planters and these farmers, and he got their support. Now, interesting thing, it wasn't just southerners who were on the support of getting rid of the Bank of the United States. Jackson found supporters in New York. You see, in New York City, you have these emerging banks on Wall Street. Maybe you heard of Wall Street? Now, Wall Street bankers, they were like the up-and-coming bankers. And they, they didn't like the fact that, that uh, the Bank of the United States was controlled by bankers in Philadelphia. See, Philadelphia were the rival banks. So a lot of Wall Street bankers supported Jackson because they wanted to get rid of the Bank of the United States and get rid of their, the influence of their, their, their rivals, the bankers in Philadelphia. So he was, Jackson was building national support. Now, another thing about Jackson is he came out opposed to protective tariffs. Remember, that's something that both Clay and Adams supported. Uh, you see, in Congress, Clay, Adams and Clay put forth in 1828 the tariff of 1828. Now this was the highest, highest tariff ever. It raised the customs duties on certain imports as high as 45 percent. So it was, it was a boom, it was a protective tariff. Now by this time southern planters were more and more opposed to tariffs because the way they view it was that it only benefited northern manufacturers and it raised prices for them. You see, they figured, why should we pay higher prices for goods because of this tax uh, only to benefit people up north? And another thing that frightened planters was they're afraid that if we put tariffs on British manufactured goods, the British might retaliate by putting tariffs on American cotton and tobacco, and that would hurt American and cotton tobacco exports. So southern planters, they all advocated what was known as free trade, the idea of not having tariffs at all. And uh, some southern planters even referred to the tariff of 1828 as the tariff of abomination. Now, uh, Jackson, he went over to these outspoken critics of the tariff, and he got them on his side. And he even recruited John C. Calhoun of South Carolina to run along with him as his vice presidential running mate. Now, now uh, by, 18, by the 1820s, Calhoun was no longer an economic nationalist. You know, when he saw cotton becoming the mainstay of the southern economy, he stopped being an economic nationalist and became a big champion of states' rights and free trade. So he, had, he was the most outspoken person against the tariff, and Jackson brought him along as an ally by making him his running mate. Now, another thing about Jackson was that he was a heroic Indian fighter. People remembered his great victory at Horseshoe, at Horseshoe Bend. And you've got to remember that a lot of farmers out west, they they were still afraid of Indian attacks. And from their perspective, John Quincy Adams was a New Englander, and he was just out of touch with the concerns of frontiersmen. A lot, you've got to remember that a lot of frontiersmen, they thought of Indians the same way that Americans today might think of Al-Qaeda. They, they saw them as terrorists, as monsters, as savages. So, so ja the fact that Jackson was a defender against Indians and an Indian, heroic Indian fighter, that made him a, lot of, uh, a, a, a hero to a lot of Americans, especially out west, where Indian attacks were, were a possibility, were a, could happen. Now, another thing about Jackson was that he had a lot of support from a, a new group of Americans, Irish and German immigrants. You see, by the time we get to the 1820s and 1830s, immigrants were pouring into America, 
from places like Philadelphia, Boston. They're going into Philadelphia, Boston, and New York City. And a lot of these immigrants from Ireland in particular were Roman Catholic. And uh, when they came into this country, a lot of times the Protestant majority viewed them with a lot of suspicion. Roman Catholics were, were discriminated against. Sometimes they weren't hired. Sometimes they were even attacked in the streets uh, because Protestants generally associated Roman Catholicism with tyranny, uh, with superstition. I mean, many Americans felt that you couldn't be a Roman Catholic and still be a good American at the same time. And so a lot of Americans viewed these Roman Catholics with a lot of disdain and distrust and contempt. And uh, the thing about Jackson is he went out and he appealed to these immigrants. He went to the Democratic Party, they went to these immigrants and said, look, we love you, vote for us. And so basically, they won over a solid block of voters who were now going to vote for the Democratic Party. So, so, so Democratic, Jackson had a, had a national support uh, from all different parts of the country, immigrants from the north, planters from the south, farmers from the west. And uh, in 1828, Jackson was able to use this new Democratic Republican Party or Democratic Party, uh, which had all this new organization and was able to engage the voters. And uh, they were able to just, just dominate the election um, the, and win by a landslide. The, uh, John Quincy Adams was running for national, for, for re-election. He didn't have the same party structure. He called himself a national Republican to distinguish himself from, from, um, from, from uh, Jackson. But basically, uh, he didn't have national support. He didn't have the same level of organization. In fact, in the election of 1828, the only area that, that voted for Quincy, John Quincy Adams was his native New England. The whole rest of the country voted for Andrew Jackson and the Democratic Party. Jackson won 73% of the popular vote. I don't think there's been an election since where a president has dominated an election to the degree that the Democrats and Andrew Jackson dominated that election. Now, eventually, as we'll see, um, his opponents, the, the opponents of Jackson, came to the conclusion that the only way to defeat the, the Democrats was to beat them at their own game, to fight fire with fire. And, and what they would do, the opponents of Jackson would do, would to, to develop their own national political party, the Whig Party. <clears throat> In the next lesson, what we're going to do is look at Jackson's political success as president and how his opponents organized a Whig Party to oppose him.